here. Okay, ah, that's much better. So my lecture uh, will be uh, mainly a theoretical lecture. There will be some formulas, and I decided to uh, have it really as a lecture. That means I will going to mainly work on the on the blackboard. Uh, now there is this uh, this pillar here. So if you want to move in front to have a better view on on the blackboard, then please do it now. There are many seats available in the front. No, use your chance. Then. Uh, and important, so if you don't see the blackboard now, then it's maybe better to change your seat now, no? because you will miss half of what I'm, I'm going to write. I will show some, some graphs and so on, uh, which uh, I, I don't have to draw then on the, on the blackboard. Another important aspect of uh, uh, having a lecture is also to have uh, questions. So I really ask you and invite you to uh, Ask questions, stop me, interrupt me, and ask if I don't, uh, if I'm too fast uh, or also too slow, if you want to hear more or less. And in order to improve this, you know, I bought some, some candies on the, on the airport. Uh, so whoever asks a question you know, uh, will be honored, uh, rewarded with a, with a candy. All right, so. Uh, let's uh, start, and the first few uh, things I'm going to tell you I actually have on slides. This should be uh, more or less uh, a motivation for the field of optomechanics and a little bit of historical introduction. So if you look back uh, in history and uh, dig deep in the journals and search for uh, uh, mirrors, Micromechanical systems coupled to light, then we arrive as usually at Einstein. So here is uh, a paper by Einstein, it's in German, uh, from uh, 1909 here, and it was published in, in the Physikalische Zeitschrift at that time. So this paper summarizes a talk he was giving um, at uh, the meeting of natural scientists and medics in Salzburg, and it's uh, about the development of our conception regarding the nature and constitution of radiation. So he was interested in finding out what is the fundamental theory of light. So, uh, four years earlier, he published his paper on the photo effect, where he uh, postulated that light is somehow composed of particles, uh, and the momentum um, or the energy of this particle is connected to its frequency via h bar nu. H, H bar, uh, yeah, H, H bar omega, sorry. And now he elaborated on this and, and wanted to know more. So what did people know about what we know now as the fundamental th theory of radiation, quantum theory, quantum electrodynamics? What was known at that time was only the black body radiation law by Planck. So Einstein uh, wanted to build on this foundation and, and know more about the nature uh, of uh, uh, radiation. So he said, assuming Planck's formula to be correct, what can we deduce about the constitution of radiation? And what he did is a Gedanken experiment, as usually. So he imagined a, a box of temperature T filled with uh, a gas of Photons, as we call it now, no, with uh, radiation, and this radiation is a thermal equilibrium with temperature T, so it's described by, the, uh, Planck, by Planck's law. So this is black, black body radiation at uh, temperature T. Now he imagines a perfectly reflecting mirror being hung there, which is free to move, maybe, maybe oscillating. Okay, so the box shifted. Uh, and in addition to that uh, 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 gas of photons, uh, there should be also a gas, uh, an ideal gas, which keeps the uh, mirror uh, in thermal equilibrium at, at temperature T. Now, I'm sorry, the, the box somehow shifted, but uh, uh, Einstein then uh, looked at was the, I, I redraw that in order to, have the arrows right, 
what he looked at was the reflection of photons of that mirror. So this mirror at some instant of time will be moving with a velocity v in one direction and then there will be photons impinging on that mirror and being reflected off that. And due to the Doppler shift, the reflected photons will have a different wave number k prime, which is given by, by this formula. So there, there, this, uh, uh, proportion, this factor here proportional to the velocity uh, is uh, simply due to the Doppler shift. Now, the photons being reflected of the mirror will transfer a momentum uh, to this uh, uh, mirror, which is the difference of the two uh, uh, wave vectors here, wave numbers of opposite sign. And this momentum transfer is a radiation pressure force. So what we get is a radiation pressure force, which has a component which is proportional to the velocity of the mirror. Now, if you have a, a, a force which is proportional to the velocity, then this acts as a friction. Yeah? So the uh, momentum of the mirror will uh, be damped out. And this uh, friction coefficient you can work out if you put in all the uh, factors of proportionality here. This damping rate of this friction force is uh, connected to the power of uh, the, the photons of uh, wave vector k. Uh, and uh, uh, divided by the rest mass uh, of this mirror. So what uh, Einstein found here is the Doppler cooling of the mirror via radiation pressure. Now, he says if this is true, there are photons of wave vector K, all of them will contribute uh, uh, a radiation pressure force here. If this is true, the mirror will be damped and uh, the, the thermal equilibrium, there, there is no thermal equilibrium. So we will just suck out energy from the ideal gas heating the mirror and transfer it to the gas of photons. So how is uh, thermal equilibrium assured in this case? So if both uh, gases, the photon gas or the, the, the electromagnetic field is a temperature T in, uh, described by, the, by Planck's law, and if the ideal gas is a temperature T, nothing should happen. Right? So what is wrong here? So he went on and argued, well, the radiation pressure here is applying maybe some damping, but at the same time, there will be also some fluctuations in this force. So this radiation pressure force also has a mean component here connected to the power, and this power will be a fluctuating thing, according to Planck's radiation law. So if there is a force which applies damping, and there is a fluctuating part of that force, this fluctuation will cause heating. So one can calculate from this argument the average squared momentum which is transferred uh, due to the radiation pressure fluctuations, and for this he used, he used Planck's law. And what he found is uh, this, I don't go through the details here, this should just serve as a motivation. Uh, there is one part uh, which looks like, uh, which is scales with the, with the density of the, uh, the energy density of the electromagnetic field. And this looks very similar to what you would expect from uh, the momentum transferred from the ideal gas composed of particles. So this looks like particles moving at energy h bar nu. And then there is a second term which scales like the density squared, which you would expect from a classical theory uh, of electromagnetism, where you have interfering waves creating uh, fluctuations uh, in, the, in the radiation uh, pressure force. So he pointed out that in addition to this uh, thing which uh, you would expect from the classical theory, there is this other uh, part coming out which looks like uh, coming from localized uh, particles. And he also points out that at low radiation, uh, at low energy densities, now, when, when rho is, uh, is, is small, then this first part actually is the dominating one because this uh, uh, scales like rho squared. So Einstein, in the year 2009, performed this as a Gedanken experiment, you know, with, with his main intention being to figure out what is the true fundamental nature of uh, the electromagnetic field. Now, 100 years later, we can say this can be done, not in that way. But we can cool mirrors through the radiation. We can see the limiting, uh, 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 
the, the limit of these cooling mechanisms being given by quantum fluctuations of the radiation field. So these are things which have been uh, achieved in the last years in the fields of, of optomechanics. That is a very early uh, um, uh, realization, in theory at least, of optomechanics. Let's make a big jump and, and go to the year 1980. I flash here another paper by Carlton Case on uh, the radiation pressure fluctuations in interfer interferometers. And uh, I show you this paper here also because it has a very nice abstract. So if you ever write a paper, this is how you should phrase an abstract. No, he says, the interferometers now being developed in, to detect gravitational waves work by measuring small changes in the positions of free masses. There has been a controversy where the quantum, so the first sentence puts the context, the second sentence puts the problem. There has been a controversy where the quantum mechanical radiation pressure fluctuations, fluctuations disturb this measurement. And the third sentence gives the solution. This letter resolves the controversy. They do. Okay, so what he was looking at is a gravitational wave detector. That's a big Michelson interferometer. Light is sent along two orthogonal arms. And uh, the main aim is to measure the difference of the length of those arms to a mind-blowing precision. Precise enough that if it happens that a gravitational wave runs through this detector, the space-time distortion changes the length to a degree which is measurable in this interferometer. Okay, that's the idea of a gravitational wave detector. Now, why do radiation pressure fluctuations come in here? You all know that in an interferometer, the precision of the uh, measure, measurement of the relative length of these two arms here, the precision grows with the power you inject into this, into this interferometer. What you measure is a phase change. If the, the, the two arms are slightly unbalanced, you will uh, see a uh, uh, phase change, uh, you will, the, the two beams get a relative phase change and you will see light coming out in this detector. Now, the uh, uh, phase of the electromagnetic field you're measuring here has a certain quantum uncertainty and the phase change scales with the power you inject. So in principle, you can just put in more and more and more power, increase your signal relative to your measurement uncertainty, which is given by the ultimately the, the uh, quantum fluctuations in the phase of the field here. Yeah? So that sounds like a free lunch. We just have to you know, use an, a, a lot of power in order to increase uh, the measurement sensitivity, sensitivity relative to our measurement uh, strength, to our measurement noise. Now, there is a catch, and this is pointed out by, by Carlton Caves, and actually this paper maybe was, uh, uh, marks the end of a longer controversy, which, uh, as he pointed out, uh, 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 was, uh, you, you can read in the literature. So this uh, question whether there are uh, fl quantum fluctuations uh, disturbing this logic uh, uh, goes back to, uh, started with Braginsky, and then many people like Bill Unruh and so on contributed to that. Now, Carlton Caves here uh, gives, I think, a decisive uh, answer to it. So what is the catch? The catch is if you increase the, the power of this laser driving the interferometer, at some point what happens is that the radiation pressure acting on those mirrors, very much in the spirit of what Einstein argued, the radiation pressure fluctuations grow with power. The more power you use, the higher will be the radiation pressure fluctuations. So you, you will actually change this length you're trying to measure by your measurement apparatus. It's the measurement back action, yeah, which at some point limits your measurement sensitivity. So what happens is if you increase power, you first increase your, your sensitivity, but then there will be an optimal spot after which the measurement back action will spoil the sensitivity again. And this is what is called the standard quantum limit in gravitational wave detectors. And uh, it is a realization of Heisenberg's microscope. You know this Gedanken experiment of, of Heisenberg. You know, he imagines uh, an, an electron which is uh, measured under 
in a microscope, you shine light on the electron, you collect the scattered light, and you try to localize this electron in space. You want to see it in the microscope. So the spatial resolution of uh, your microscope is, of course, connected to the wavelengths you're using, but it is also proportional or inverse proportional to the angle of uh, the, uh, uh, the collection angle of your, of your microscope. So the larger your collection angle is, the better is your resolution. But there is also a catch. The photons which are scattered off the electron will impart a momentum to the electron. And this uh, momentum transfer will have, that's the Compton recoil simply, the momentum transfer will have an uncertainty which scales also to the opening angle. The wider is your opening angle, your collection angle, the less you know about the uh, momentum uh, transfer onto this uh, electron. And you see there is a trade-off here, and you will never go below Heisenberg's uncertainty. So the measurement back action limits the sensitivity uh, of this microscope, and this is exactly the same thing as the standard quantum limit in the gravitational wave detector. By the way, the standard quantum limit in the gravitational wave detector has not been achieved. The standard quantum limit has not been achieved in any experiment, also not in, in any other realization of optomechanics. What has been achieved in experiment is to see the measurement back action on top of a thermal background. Reaching the standard quantum limit means reaching a sensitivity where the measurement back action and the measurement noise, the short noise of light, contribute on, on, on equal parts. And this is uh, so far still elusive. I think this is one of the big uh, goals in the field to see this. And gravitational wave detectors uh, are designed to actually uh, reach ultimately this sensitivity, but they are not there yet. Now, that's the second uh, 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 highlight uh, of optomechanics I, I want to uh, point out here in this little uh, uh, historical review. And then as a third one, um, I, I would like to flash this paper by uh, Roger Penrose and Dick Baumeister, published in, in the year 2003, so uh, almost 15 years ago now. In retrospect, I think probably the authors themselves would not write this paper in the same way, um, but I think it was a really visionary paper at that time, and, and it triggered a lot uh, of, of uh, subsequent development, uh, technical development, and ultimately, uh, in the second order effect, triggered a lot of other, uh, maybe even more interesting experiments than, than what they suggested. But what they uh, were uh, thinking about is, can we perform an experiment uh, of this sort? Can we set up, uh, again, a Michelson interferometer, and in one arm, uh, we put a little moving mirror. Now, we take a single photon, Injecting, inject it into this uh, Michelson interferometer, so the photon uh, goes into a, a superposition between being in arm A and arm B. Now here it's just an empty cavity, so the photon will run in and run out. And if the photon is in arm A here, it will enter this cavity and it will impart a momentum transfer to this mirror. Now this momentum transfer will displace the mirror the photon will come back. So what we created is actually a superposition of the photon being in arm B and the mirror maybe in its ground state plus the photon in arm A and the mirror in some displaced state, say a coherent state uh, due to the momentum transfer it received fr from the photon. So this creates an entangled state uh, between the two systems and the mirror, they argued, uh, is a macroscopic, relatively macroscopic thing. Now, we know we can create superpositions uh, of two photons, but can we also create a superposition of a massive mechanical oscillator like this mirror? So this is motivated, of course, by the Gedanken experiment of, of Schrödinger with his cat, where the idea is that you have a radioactive, at that time, a radioactive uh, particle decaying or not decaying. So this is ultimately also a coherent process where the atom can be decayed or it is not decayed. We don't know. Okay, so this, the weights of these components will, will shift with time in the known manner, but it goes to a superposition and now we uh, somehow manage to uh, uh, create a mechanism uh, which kills a cat if the atom decays or not. 
So we would go to the superposition of the atom decayed, uh, or the atom uh, still uh, not decayed, so no decay, and the cat alive, plus the atom decayed, and the cat dead. So the idea was, you know, can we create a Schrodinger cat with this mechanical oscillator? And they work, went through the numbers and uh, worked out the, the conditions for, for this to work and uh, made some, some bold claims that this is going uh, uh, to work. And Dirk Baumeister is sort of still pursuing this idea. Again, I think it wouldn't be written in the same way uh, now, 15 years later, but uh, the main ideas of you know, using light to create uh, uh, this sort of entanglement between light and atoms, this works. Not in this way, but we will see in different ways you can actually do this. You can create these sort of superpositions, even with macroscopic uh, objects. So this is the last um, uh, um, like uh, a histor historical flash I would like to show you to motivate uh, this field of optomechanics. And after these uh, lectures you will hear, uh, you will be able to understand all of these uh, three aspects I, I uh, mentioned. The cooling plus its quantum limitations, the standard quantum limit of measurement and what it means uh, regarding quantum effects in optomechanics and ultimately also something like uh, optomechanical entanglement, entangled state uh, between mechanical oscillators and light. So that's uh, a bit uh, the outline um, of the lecture. And with that, uh, I would like to start as promised. Wow, this is really bad, no? The lecture on the blackboard. Start here. So this is supposed to be an introduction uh, to optomechanics, please. If you cannot read it, too small? Size okay? Or too small? It's not small, but I can't read it. You cannot read it. Oh, well. <laughs> so I'll try to improve my handwriting. Better? Well, you, see, you also hear my words, okay? So this is an introduction to optomechanics. But what is the problem? It's my handwriting. <laughs> it's better than before, no? Okay, so we should meet halfway somehow. So the first part is on mechanical oscillators. And what we will uh, mostly be dealing with uh, in, in this uh, course is the deformation of solids. So imagine you have some piece of solid and the mechanical oscillations will deform this solid in some way. Now the these deformations will be described by a displacement field. which is a vector field, so assigns to each point in the solid a displacement 
how much this particular infinitesimal volume is displaced by the vibrations in, this, in the solid from its uh, equilibrium position. There will be uh, lectures on uh, uh, nanomechanics, and I uh, guess you will hear much more about that. But what I can promise you is that it is possible to decompose this displacement field here into a sum over normal modes. So these uh, uh, solids will have particular eigenmodes of oscillation, and these eigenmodes have a particular um, a mode function u m um, of r, and x m of t is the amplitude of eigenmode m. So the time dependence goes into the amplitude. The spatial dependence is in the eigenmode um of r. For small displacements, these amplitudes here will just fulfill the equations of a harmonic oscillator. Which is driven by whatever external force there is. And what goes into this equation of motion is also a parameter uh, which is called the, the effective mass of the eigenmode uh, um. So omega m is the resonance frequency, obviously. Gamma m is the damping rate. And M effective is the effective mass of eigenmode um of r of this solid. And f external are whatever external forces there are acting uh, on this object. So one important number, dimensionless number, which we can assign to any particular eigenmode, mechanical eigenmode of, of such a body, is the quality factor, which is the ratio of its resonance frequency, omega m, to its damping rate, gamma m. And we will be mainly dealing with high quality uh, mechanical oscillators. So a high quality means we are in the underdamped regime of, of these modes. Uh, so we can see uh, many, many oscillations uh, of this mechanical oscillator within the damping, the decay time, the ring down time um, of, of this uh, eigenmode. So if we are uh, in the high Q limit, maybe uh, you know, 10 to the 8 or so can be achieved. So we make 10 to the 8 oscillations be before 
uh, an amplitude dies out of these mechanical oscillators, you might say, well, this is such a good oscillator, let's forget about uh, the, the, the damping here. Um, but actually, this is, of course, uh, uh, not allowed, especially when we are interested uh, in, in thinking about uh, quantum mechanical effects performed with these sort of oscillators. Along with the damping which we have here by the fluctuation dissipation theorem, there has to be also some fluctuation in the force which is acting uh, on this mechanical oscillator. Ultimately, from a microscopic point of view, uh, you can think of this damping uh, as an effect of this eigenmode being not a true eigenmode uh, of uh, uh, this system, but this eigenmode is, is a pretty good resonance, but it is still coupled to some environment. Maybe uh, this body is you know, supported uh, to some frame, and this frame also has eigenmodes and phonons, and they you know, talk to this uh, body via this support. So these eigenmodes uh, are damped exactly due to this uh, uh, coupling to the environment. And then through the same coupling, you, we will also have some random force acting uh, on these mechanical oscillators. And in particular, uh, in this external force, There are always thermal or at least vacuum fluctuations which I call Ft of t. And in the following we will assume that uh, this is actually the, the dominant part of our uh, noise. So what about numbers? So let me summarize this again. We can uh, think of a structure like, like this uh, drum mode here, uh, uh, which was introduced by, by Jack Harris. And these uh, drum modes, you can imagine, have these sort of eigenmodes. So uh, if we for perform uh, uh, the analysis and uh, really uh, uh, figure out the eigenmodes of, of this uh, system here, we will find a comb of frequencies associated with particular eigenmodes, and we have this displacement field. Now, this is one example, the sub suspended membrane here, uh, but there are many more uh, examples, uh, like mirrors which are hung, or uh, suspended micromirrors, which are more in the spirit of what I have sketched on the board here. Uh, we can have microtoroids uh, with particular mechanical eigenmodes uh, we will, uh, or the sort of nanodisks uh, nano uh, coupled to waveguides. Uh, John will uh, uh, tell us much more about uh, drums coupled to microwave uh, circuits here. We can have photonic crystals I will mention uh, later on in my lecture. We can even go to cold atoms being trapped in, in optical fields and talk about their uh, mechanical uh, oscillations. And you see that these realizations of uh, mechanical systems span a huge range of effective masses, going from the gram or even kilogram scale down to the scale uh, of atoms uh, on the order of septograms. So this should give you an, an impression of what, what uh, range of masses we can cover uh, with this uh, logic. Here is a scatter plot uh, which I take from the review of modern physics uh, by Markus Aspelmeyer, Tobias Kippenberg, and Florian Marquardt from uh, uh, 2014, where we look at the mechanical quality factor and the mechanical frequency. And you see that uh, we have typically uh, mechanical frequencies on the order of megahertz or tens uh, of megahertz going up to the gigahertz uh, regime and uh, mechanical quality factors, uh, say, below 10 to the 8. So this is uh, uh, from the year 2014, and since then, uh, this uh, uh, a new scatter plot will probably have moved up quite a bit, and uh, there are experiments now uh, uh, demonstrating quality factors above uh, 10 to the 8. All right, so this is... Yes? Uh -huh. So a candidate for a candy. Uh, some question back up in the uh, eigenmodal dimensions. Before you 
you say this eigenmodal has lost because it's not a true eigenmodal of the system. If you consider the environment and your mechanics, is it possible to find the true eigenmodal of it and work on it? One can come up with a, a microscopic uh, uh, derivation of, of this uh, line width and also, of course, then uh, for the fluctuations uh, due to a remaining coupling of, of your eigenmodes to the environment. So you can do a microscopic theory. This is not what I'm going to do here. Uh, I will use this uh, description more on a phenomenological level. I mean, this is the, the line which, which, which is ultimately method, measured. And then along, uh, and this could be even due to several processes. I mean, this could be due to the support of, uh, as, I, as I sketched here, uh, uh, of this system, but this could also be due to some sort of impurity of the material itself. Maybe there are some two-level fluctuators, some electronic degrees of freedom, which couple to these vibrations and also contribute to the line width. So what one can come up with microscopic models uh, um, giving an answer to what, what the expected uh, line width is. And of course, if you uh, are clever uh, and, and you know, take into account maybe parts of the vibrations outside, then you can, in your description, improve uh, uh, the, I mean, the, the eigenmodes you're working with is uh, uh, to a certain degree up to you. I mean, the cut between what is your system and what is the environment is uh, up to you. Um, but here we will dump everything which we cannot control into into this damping rate and the and the fluctuations which are driving this source today. Okay. Good. All right. Now the next step. This is still. Uh, valid also on a classical uh, level here and now we will uh, quickly move to the uh, uh, quantum description of the same system. So from in the following we restrict to one resonance. So there will be many, there will be a comb of them in general for some structures there will be actually only one that really depends on the realization. In our uh, uh, toy model we are going to develop here, uh, we are mainly uh, uh, focusing on one particular uh, mechanical mode. And then you can look at the index M I was using as just indicating this is the mechanical part of uh, what I'm going to talk about. In a quantum treatment, We just impose on the amplitudes of all of these eigenmodes a canonical commutator xm and pm, the canonical uh, momentum, commutes to i uh, h bar. And there is an intrinsic length scale. <laughs> in a harmonic oscillator, which is the zero-point fluctuation. It's h-bar over 2 m effective omega m as you know from your uh, basic course in quantum mechanics. So this is uh, 
the variance of your position coordinate in the quantum mechanical ground state. And with this length scale, we can introduce a dimensionless operators. And these I denote by small. So this should be a capital letter here. And in the, uh, I will quickly now switch to these lowercase letters and only use them essentially in the following. So there is no danger of confusion, but on this particular line. So lowercase capital. And there is a factor of two. So it's the position coordinate scale to square root of two uh, zero point fluctuations. And a dimensionless momentum variable, which is PM well, square root of two x zero point fluctuation over h bar times PM. So the momentum is, of course, scaled to the characteristic momentum length scale here, which is connected to the zero point fluctuation uh, via h bar. And these dimensionless operators fulfill that they commute to i instead of i h bar. So we go to dimensionless coordinates, which is always uh, convenient. And we can introduce creation and annihilation operators. That's 1 over square root of 2 xm plus i pm. And we dagger the joint. And as creation and annihilation operators of a harmonic oscillator, the canonical commutator implies that they commute to 1, as you all know. And We will have an harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian, which in the dimension full variables is the kinetic energy and the potential energy of the harmonic oscillator. We can represent it in terms of the dimensionless uh, quantities. Then this is, you can do this uh, easily on your own. This is just h bar omega h bar omega m half x m squared plus p m squared, and we can convert this also in the to the language of creation and annihilation operators, and this then this will be h bar omega m b dagger b plus one half. So this is. Uh, uh, simple consequence of, of these definitions and things you are uh, uh, aware of from, from your courses in, in quantum mechanics. Now, the equations of motion which are implied by, by this Hamiltonian Right here. So we are working here in the Heisenberg picture. So we track the time dependence of 
uh, quantities like position and momentum would be I over H bar and then the commutator of H with uh, the position. Now we can, for example, take this form of our Hamiltonian. So there will be the part uh, proportional to the potential energy Xm squared, which uh, does not contribute in the, in the commutator. And then we have I omega M half commutator of Pm squared and Xm. And this is just omega m xm at uh, pm, sorry, pm. And in the same way, we derive pm dot is minus omega m xm in the dimension less uh, representation. And now you can say, wow, but this hammer, this uh, equations of motion do not correspond to what I have written down before where we also had damping and, and maybe some uh, uh, fluctuating force associated with this damping. Of course not, because this Hamiltonian describes only our eigenmode. In order to also see the damping or the fluctuations, what we would have to do is to uh, add to this Hamiltonian the Hamiltonian of the environment and the Hamiltonian of the coupling of the environment to our particular eigenmode, and then do a proper theory which would lead ultimately to a damping showing up in these Heisenberg equations of motion. This is possible, and I suppose we will hear more uh, about that in the lecture on, on nanomechanics. I'm uh, not going to do that. I'm giving you the result of this, and this is just what we had in the other equation. What you would find is something like this. So this is now put in by hand. So this would follow from a microscopic theory of damping. And the Password here is the Caldera legged model, which is a model giving rise to this. And for a particular concrete realization, you in principle have to do that from scratch. Every time you have a new system, there will be a new uh, 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 environment which gives rise to damping. So a microscopic theory really has to cover uh, uh, each uh, system uh, specifically. Um, Still, there are certain standard models which are applicable in a huge range uh, of physical scenarios, and the caldera legged model is, is one of them. Again, this uh, would give rise, uh, depending on which model you, you uh, use, uh, give rise to such a Brownian motion-like model where you have a viscous force acting on the uh, mechanical oscillator and a certain fluctuating thermal force uh, acting on it. Now, this uh, Ft I'm writing here is the, essentially the thermal force I'm introducing before. But now we go to dimensionless units. So we scale also uh, this force here to something which is almost dimensionless. So that is scaled to multiplied by x ZBF over h bar. That's essentially the uh, characteristic momentum scale. And it is convenient to divide also by the square root of the damping. And the dimension of this lowercase f of t is square root of hertz, 1 over uh, square root of seconds, for the reason which uh, will become clear in a second. So now we want to know, say a little bit about uh, the properties of this fluctuating force here. And I'm giving here only the behavior of this force in the high temperature limit. And high temperature means here that I assume that uh, KBT, the thermal energy, is larger 
than the quantum of the harmonic oscillator, h bar omega m. So this is what I mean by high temperature here. And also the high Q limit, so the high mechanical equality fa factor limit. For these two limits, it is justified to uh, use uh, zero mean white noise model for these uh, forces, at least to a zeroth approximation of, of the damping. So I'm spending a little bit of time here to properly or sufficiently at least uh, uh, introduce the description of open uh, quantum systems, which is maybe something you have heard and maybe there are many of you who did not hear about that. So I think it's important for this uh, meeting. This is why I'm spending this time. And this zero mean white noise model for the fluctuating forces assumes that, well, this is her zero mean, that's uh, not a particularly surprising thing. And then there is a particular correlator in time So we can ask, when I say this force is fluctuating, we can ask how much it is fluctuating. So how does the value of this force at time t compare to its value at some other time t prime? Yeah? I symmetrize that expression and take the average. The average is, respect, is uh, with respect to the uh, path or with respect to the state of the environment. Now this uh, thing is fluctuating uh, in time. And if this is a stationary process, we expect that this depends only on the difference of these two times. And in the white noise limit, these forces fluctuate so strongly that actually they are proportional to a Dirac delta. Yeah? So they have uh, something to do with each other only at the same time, and if they are uh, separated uh, by an epsilon, they are already uncorrelated. Yeah? The, uh, the values of this f are uh, strongly uh, uh, correlated only at uh, equal times tt prime, and there they take on uh, a value which is uh, 2n bar plus 1, where in the high temperature limit, we can simply that kbt over h bar omega m. So I assume again that uh, in, in the lectures on nanomechanics, uh, you will hear uh, more details about the derivation of, of these things. But for our purpose, uh, this is the minimal model we uh, are going to use to describe the thermal fluctuations acting on the mechanical oscillator. And by assumption, this is uh, much larger than one in the high temperature. So the n bar is the average phonon number in thermal equilibrium. And how large uh, is that? Let's uh, look at uh, a little table here. I plot here this uh, number n bar, the average thermal phono numbers uh, versus frequency for particular uh, temperatures. So at room temperature, we see that uh, megahertz uh, uh, up to gigahertz uh, oscillators we are dealing with in optomechanics at room temperature have a huge thermal occupation um, hundreds of thousands, uh, several million. If we would like to go to the ground state by just cooling the environment, let's say 
uh, here to 100 uh, Kelvin, uh, uh, or we can maybe also go a little bit lower to 20 millikelvin or so, we really have to go to high uh, frequency oscillators in the uh, gigahertz, the tens of gigahertz range to go uh, below uh, one, which would be the ground state. So John is, I'm sure, going to uh, show us uh, uh, some uh, examples of where you can actually do that. So high frequency uh, systems at uh, low temperatures, which are in the ground state just by passive uh, cooling. But uh, for typical optomechanical experiments uh, working with light, uh, we are dealing with huge uh, thermal occupation numbers in thermal equilibrium. So it's uh, also uh, interesting and useful to take these equations of motion and rewrite them in terms of the creation and annihilation operators. So if these are uh, one here, then we can write one is equivalent. So the, the figures I will uh, uh, upload uh, on the web page, so you will be able to, to get them from there. So B dot would be 1 over square root of 2 xm dot plus i pm dot. And we just use our uh, equations of motion here uh, to rewrite this as minus i omega m pm. So this comes from the part which is actually covered by by the Hamiltonian. So this will give rise to this minus i omega m b m. And then on top of that, there will be the part due to damping, gamma m half b plus b dagger plus i square root of gamma m f t t. And now, there is yet another model for describing this damping. This is uh, the Brownian motion model, where we have the viscous force, which takes out, uh, which, which, just, which is proportional to the velocity. And we have a force acting on the momentum, as you would expect for, from a, a mechanical oscillator. But sometimes it's more convenient uh, to uh, use uh, these equations here, and then for the high frequency oscillators, so for high quality factors, it is justified to drop the B dagger here in a, in a rotating wave approximation, which you are maybe familiar with from courses in electrodynamics. And when working in the creation and annihilation uh, operator language, it is uh, uh, common to describe the forces as B in. And we can read off here that B in of T is I F T T. And in terms of these we have the correlator in time of these uh, fluctuating forces 
being given by, by this uh, expression here. This is the same as, as I have written before. So the, if, if you imagine uh, that we take out the fast oscillation here at frequency omega m, yeah? so we could go, we could define something like a B tilde operator, which is e to the i omega m b. So take, let's go to a reference frame rotating with the oscillator. Then this guy here would, in this uh, language of the tilde operators, oscillate at twice the, the oscillation frequency omega m. Now this would uh, be an, uh, a slowly varying operator, and this would be, so we can write this once, no? we introduce this p tilde, and rewrite the whole equation for the tilde operators. And then here we would have a 2i omega m t And this is a, a, a fast oscillating uh, thing, oscillating much faster than, uh, oscillating very fast on a scale of gamma m. Yeah? And then we, we can drop it. This is true for high quality oscillators where omega m is much, much larger than gamma m. Okay? Then uh, essentially we can symmetrize uh, the, the damping so if you take this uh, equation here for, for B and reconvert it to position and momentum, what you would see uh, that the momentum would still be damped by gamma, but now only with gamma m half, plus there will be some noise acting on the momentum, but also the position in this uh, model of damping would be damped in a symmetric way. So let's just say if you have a Brownian motion damping model where the oscillator feels a frictious force and a fluctuating force acting both on the momentum, if you, are, if you have a high Q oscillator, this thing is oscillating so fast that both canonical variables, X and P, feel the same damping on average, uh, averaged over a few cycles. And both are subject to fluctuating uh, forces, okay? This is uh, the physics behind uh, this, this approximation. Okay, so that was a question, and actually there was a question before. I forgot the sentence, you shouldn't complain. Do you want, yes? Good. So I claimed always that, that this n bar here is uh, the um, occupation in thermal equilibrium. As an example here, we can we can check that briefly. So let's let's solve this equation here. The solution to the equation of motion which we have here is e to the minus i omega m plus gamma m half t b of zero plus square root of gamma m integral zero to t t t prime e to the i omega m plus gamma m half t prime b in of t prime. So B0 is the initial condition, the solution to the homogeneous equation, and then this integral here over B in is the solution to the inhomogeneous uh, part. We can quickly convince ourselves that this is a solution. If we take the derivative, we will get down this prefactor, i omega plus gamma m half, 
in front of everything, which is B, that reproduces the first two parts, the homogeneous solution, or we can say the index B here. And then uh, the inner derivative here in the brackets uh, evaluates the integrand at time t, then the exponentials here cancel, and we get g m gamma square root of gamma m times uh, b in as the inhomogeneity. So this is indeed uh, the solution to the equation of motion here. Now, the occupation number would be calculated from, from this uh, quantity, B dagger B, average. And this average is now with respect to the environment. And the initial state of the system. Now let's use our solution. So this is minus minus omega m plus gamma m half t times i omega m plus gamma m half t. So we get this prefactor here once conjugated because we have an b dagger. And then there will be b, the average of b dagger of zero, v of zero. So that is the average with respect to the initial state. And then there will be two time integrals. Similar prefactors in here, minus i omega m plus gamma m half t prime e to the i omega m plus gamma m half t two prime. And then the average of b dagger in T prime B in of T two prime. So that is the average with respect to the environment plus something which I don't even bother to write down, which for example depends on the correlator between the initial state and the path, the fluctuating forces, and this is zero. No correlations initially. Bracket closed. So we are left with two terms. Now for the correlator, of the fluctuating force, we can use what I have written before. This is n bar plus one half delta t minus t prime. So that allows us to, to take the, the integrals. So from, from here, we also see that these frequencies drop out and we get minus gamma m t And this is the initial occupation number, average of occupation number n naught. This is b dagger 0, b 0. And then we can take one time integral using this uh, delta function. I'm sorry, there is a factor.
factor gamma m ha gamma m missing from the square root of gamma m squared. So this is gamma m n bar plus one half, and what remains is an integral over time p t e to the gamma m t. So for equal arguments uh, with the time here, the frequencies also drop out because they have different signs and the gamma gammas add up. And now what is left is uh, to uh, evaluate these integrals. And what we find is that the occupation number at time t is e to the minus gamma m t initial occupation number plus take the integral e to the minus gamma m t n bar uh, I'm sorry, this should be, uh, this, this is n bar, yeah, this is actually true for b, b dagger here, the one half and then uh, b dagger b, I'll, I'll check it later, let me write this, uh, this out first, so this is n bar, uh, which which survives here. So what we see is that the occupation number at time t will be damped out. So the initial occupation number will be damped out and it will be replaced in the long time limit with n bar, the average occupation number uh, uh, as I, I promised. Yes, it, it should be n plus n plus one, yes, so thanks. Yes, and there, there will be this commutator between the noises B T, B dagger in T prime, delta T minus T prime, which uh, assures uh, or which implies then that B dagger B is delta correlated with N bar. Okay, thanks. You want a candy? Okay. <laughs> Good. So if we would have uh, initially started with an arbitrary level of uh, the fluctuating force, then this calculation would ultimately tie this arbitrary level, this number uh, which we could have left open in the beginning would have tied it ultimately to the thermal, to the uh, occupation number in thermal equilibrium. So far I was talking about mechanical oscillators and for optomechanics, we also have to talk about optical resonators before we can talk about the coupling among mechanical oscillators and optical resonators. A toy model for an optical resonator is a fabry perot resonator so most optomechanical experiments actually employ something physically very different but let's still talk about uh, fabry perot resonators first so we have two etalons separated by uh, length L. I think I even have a figure here. And if we treat solve Maxwell's equations with these boundary conditions, 
then we find in, in principle the same thing as we found for the mechanical oscillators. We will find a set of eigenmodes. And a fabry barreau resonator exhibits eigenmodes at integer multiples of some fundamental frequency, which is the free spectral range. So we will have this comp of resonances all separated by a free spectral, what is called the free spectral range. And this is essentially connected to the round trip time of the field inside uh, this uh, fabry barreau resonator, C over 2L times 2 pi, if we are talking uh, about angular frequencies. Apart from these, in principle, on paper, ultimately sharp resonances, in reality, we will always have a certain width of these resonances, and these are in, at least due to the uh, finite reflectivity of the end mirrors. Which gives rise to a power decay, so to fields leaking out of that cavity at rate kappa, which is connected to the uh, uh, width uh, of these resonances. An important parameter in the game of optical resonators is the so-called finesse which is the ratio of the free spectral range over kappa. And you can imagine that uh, uh, optical resonators become interesting, especially in the regime of a high finesse, where these uh, resonances are much sharper than their separation. So that means F should be large. And just as we did, in the case of the mechanical oscillators, we will now, based on this assumption that there are resolved resonances, we will pick out one of these resonances and forget about all of the others. So we will focus on one resonance at frequency, let's call this here, omega c, where the c reminds us uh, that this is a frequency of a cavity. So now we are interested in deriving a quantum description of this uh, uh, cavity mode. And again, I will just summarize the result, and it will look very similar to what we arrived at for the mechanical oscillators. So we will describe this particular cavity mode in quantum electrodynamics by an harmonic oscillator, described by creation and annihilation operators commuting uh, to one. The electric field. would be given by some mode function for this particular uh, uh, cavity resonance we're looking at times, let's for convenience put here a factor of 1 over square root of 2, a plus a dagger. So this would be the observable corresponding to the electric field connected to the creation and annihilation operators of our cavity mode.
and this suggests that we uh, look at what is called the amplitude and phase quadratures of the cavity mode. So maybe let me note here again that this is the amplitude of or a single amplitude and wave function, mode function of a single photon. So by solving Maxwell's equations, we find these eigenmodes, and they you know, come out of, of Maxwell's equations. And then uh, quantization means we replace uh, amplitudes by creation and uh, annihilation operators with proper normalization. So due to the fact that the electric field would be given by uh, A plus A dagger, essentially, uh, we can define the amplitude quadrature xc and the phase quadrature, the conjugate variable pc. And these are canonical variables as we had it for the mechanical oscillator. And we can repeat the game we played for the mechanical degree of freedom. So this particular cavity mode of frequency omega c would have this uh, Hamiltonian here, which implies the equation of motion. A dot is minus i omega c a. So write it down once, i over h bar. Heisenberg's equations of motion. And this is treating an ideal cavity without losses. But let's do that for a second and see what comes out. So A of T would be E to the minus I omega C T A of zero. And with that, we could uh, evaluate, for example, what the electric field at time T would be. So that would be this mode function A of R inside the cavity. And then we have here A e to the minus i omega ct 1 over square root of 2 plus A dagger e to the i omega ct. And we can decompose this into x c cosine omega c t plus sine plus p c sine omega c t. So in an electric field, we will have in a field mode of frequency omega c, we will have a component oscillating like cosine omega t and a component oscillating like sine omega t. So I'm going to just convert that, and you will, you will uh, see that you will uh, have the so-called amplitude and phase quadrature appearing here. And this should explain the, the notions, the, the terminology of amplitude and phase quadrature here. So xc describes the component of the electric field oscillating in, in uh, phase with cosine omega t. So that should be our reference. The amplitude and p 
GC describes the field oscillating pi half out of phase. That's the phase quadrature. Okay, so this is where, where this terminology uh, comes from. So Xc, again, is the amplitude, or describes the amplitude of field oscillating like the cosine. And Pc describes the amplitude of the field oscillating like the pi half shifted field, the sine component. These fields are not independent. They are canonical conjugate variables. Okay, so they fulfill the canonical commutator, and the canonical commutator implies, in particular, Heisenberg's uncertainty. So this is why uh, we cannot have a field with an infinitely uh, well-defined uh, amplitude quadrature and phase quadrature uh, at the same time, which will give rise, uh, for example, to the standard quantum limit I mentioned before, when we look at an optomechanical system as a force sensor or a sensor for gravitational waves. Good. So the last thing I want to write down um, is just the equation of motion, including noise. So we uh, already argued that uh, these cavity resonances will not be infinitely sharp. They will be coupling to the environment, in particular to the lossy mirrors of these two uh, uh, etalons. And there will be electromagnetic modes outside. Photons are uh, able to leave the cavity and tunnel uh, to the uh, field modes outside. On the other hand, also, at least vacuum fluctuations from the outside will drive the cavity mode through these uh, open mirrors. And this can be modeled, again, in principle, on a microscopic level, very much in the spirit of the caldera legged model or the rotating wave approximation of, of that. And I just state the result. So the equation of motion would be I omega C plus kappa half A. So there is an overall minus that is the, the damping. The field amplitude, so A is always associated uh, an observable, it's not an observable, but it's an operator associated with the amplitude of the field, as I have explained, will decay at kappa half. Kappa is a power decay. And associated with that uh, decay, there will be vacuum or maybe also thermal noise fluctuations driving the system. So now we have to imagine that one of, at least one of these mirrors is lossy, and what comes from outside is A in of T, and this is, as before, the zero mean field, adopting, again, a white noise model. And the correlator in time is delta t minus t prime. So now I'm writing here a, a dagger commutator of these fields is also delta correlated. And this is now valid at temperature zero. zero. If there was a non-zero temperature, we would have some occupation number uh, um, here in the uh, correlator. So let's label this two. 
And if you take equations one for the mechanical oscillator and two for the optical uh, uh, resonator, then these two equations will be the basis of uh, the, the formalism of optomechanics. What remains, of course, uh, to be derived, and this will be the topic of, of next uh, lecture, will be the, the optomechanical interaction. So how are light and mechanical oscillators uh, actually coupled? Today, I was uh, mainly focusing on uh, the proper description of the uh, open system dynamics of each of those two uh, parts, uh, because my experience is that, that this is maybe not uh, so familiar to uh, many students uh, in the beginning of their PhD and is troublesome. And I uh, am, of course, fully aware that for each of these uh, uh, parts I'm writing here, one could add, you know, a separate lecture on deriving all of these things. So what I told you was a compromise between you know, getting done in one and a half hours uh, with this description and uh, still being reasonable, uh, uh, self-contained. Are there any further questions? I have one uh, from the beginning of your talk. You have said that but I have seen some words that say that they do, especially using the screen in... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yes. How is this yes. Okay, so... Uh, I will I will hopefully be able to talk about the standard quantum limit in the in the third lecture. That is my plan. And I think uh, the ultimate answer will, will come then. But as a warning, the notion of the standard quantum limit is very much non-standard. So it's used in different communities in different aspects. So uh, when you forget about uh, the uh, business or the issue of measurement back action in, in due to radiation pressure in optical interferometry, then what you will find is that the short noise of your measurement is a quantum limit. There is uh, quantum fluctuations of light, and they will limit the sensitivity. But they will this sensitivity will uh, scale like one over power you're using. And then in one community uh, dealing with optical interferometry, this is used as, this is uh, termed the standard, the standard quantum limit, the SQL, the one over n scaling with the number of particles, in this case photons you inject here. Or the, the uh, community of um, frequency meteorologists using you know, clouds of atoms to measure time, uh, they also have uh, quantum noise, in this case it's fluctuations of their, of their spin, and this uh, uh, strength of these quantum fluctuations also scales like one over the number of involved particles, or one over square, it depends on whether you look at the square or the amplitude. And this is called the standard quantum limit in, in those communities. In the uh, community of gravitational wave detectors, this is called the measurement noise, and what is called the standard quantum limit is the point where they see the measurement back action coming up. It will become clearer later. Okay, but there are different notions of standard quantum limit, and when you read a paper saying we measured below the standard quantum limit, then this is this first notion. This is not what, what the gravitational wave people would, would call sub-SQL. You can get a candy. <laughs> Well, sorry. Absolutely. Yeah. But actually, on a deeper level, one actually has to go below the white noise model because the, the Brownian motion uh, model in the white noise limit uh, creates uh, a non completely positive map on a deeper level. So it's not, in principle, a physically allowed uh, um, uh, dynamics. Uh, you have to use a non-white uh, uh, force to, to fix this and get a mathematically sound uh, description. But in the high temperature, high Q limit, this works pretty well and uh, allows to understand things properly. In particular, systems, one should really sit down and look at what is my noise really? Is it white? What is its color? For example, the people, especially when you look at like anything which, which uh, is broadband in any sense. For example, again, people in gravitational wave detectors, 
want to see gravitational waves in the audio band over you know, tens or hundreds of hertz, or in the range of hundred hertz or so, uh, in current detectors, and they really want to know exactly what is their noise, because whatever signal is, is coming in is you know, swamped by all kinds of noise sources. And they have a microscopic model for you know, a, a zoo of, of noise, and they're all non-white. Yeah. So non-white, the white noise is a zero, is a, is a fine zero order approximation to experiments, and then one really should sit down and, and do things properly for case to case. Yes, we should stop. Thank you very much.